welcome to Catholic Theological Union. I am Sister Barbara Reed, president of CTU, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you this evening to this year's Winter Shapiro Lecture. The Catholic Jewish Studies Program at CTU hosts three Shapiro Lectures each year, made possible through the generosity of the Shapiro Family Foundation in Boston. For many decades, they have enabled CTU to invite world-renowned scholars to speak on a range of topics related to theology, current issues, and culture. For those of you who may be new to CTU, we were founded in 1968 in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, which issued the groundbreaking document Nostra Tate, the Declaration on the Relation of the Church with Non-Christian Religions. Since our founding, CTU has been very committed to interreligious dialogue, especially through our Catholic Jewish Studies Program and Catholic Muslim Studies Program. We are grateful for the leadership of Father John Polakowski and Rabbi, Rabbi Chaim Perlmuter, two of our founding faculty members who established the Catholic Jewish Studies Program at CTU and who launched the deep and lasting friendships that have been formed between CTU and our Jewish partners in the last five plus decades. In 2001, CTU established a chair in Jewish studies made possible by a most generous gift by Lester and Renee Crown and Patrick and Shirley Ryan. The chair has been held since 2014 by Dr. Malka Zyger Simkovich who also directs the Catholic Jewish Studies Program at CTU. Dr. Simkovich holds an MA in Hebrew Bible from Harvard University and a BA in Bible Studies and Music Theory from Stern College of Yeshiva University. She earned her PhD in Second Temple Judaism from Brandeis University. I now ask Dr. Simkovich to introduce our esteemed guest lecturer. Thank you, Sister Barbara, and good evening. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this year's Winter Shapiro Lecture, our program's first event of 2022. Our three annual Shapiro Lectures offer incredible opportunities to learn from renowned Jewish studies scholars. As you probably know, these lectures have been delivered virtually over the past two years, and we are so looking forward to returning to our in-person events, which are planned for later this spring and fall 2022. At the same time, we deeply appreciate the opportunity to welcome all of you, especially those who are tuning in tonight from beyond the Chicagoland community. I am thrilled to see that we have friends in attendance from all over the world to hear our featured speaker, Dr. Laura Liebman. Dr. Liebman is a professor of English and Humanities at Reed College in Portland, Oregon, and the author of The Art of the Jewish Family, A History of Women in Early New York and Five Objects, which won three National Jewish Book Awards. For anybody who doesn't know, that is extremely unusual and very impressive. Her work focuses on the daily lives of women and children in early America and uses everyday objects to help bring their stories back to life. Her latest book, once We Were Slaves, is about a multiracial Jewish family who began their lives enslaved in the Caribbean and became some of the wealthiest Jews in New York. We will leave aside time for questions at the end, but feel free to post questions in the chat box anytime throughout the lecture, or you can send them directly to me. I will then direct some of these questions to Dr. Liebman at the end of the lecture. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Laura Liebman. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and share a screen. So if for some reason you don't see images soon, let me know. My talk tonight comes out of work that I've been doing for the past 10 years, which were spent researching and writing uh, the book called Once We Are Slaves, which focuses on two siblings, Isaac Lopez Brandon and Sarah Rodriguez Brandon. And they began their lives enslaved poor and Christian on the island of Barbados, but by the end of their lives were some of the wealthiest Jews in New York. In today's talk, I'm going to focus in primarily on the life of Isaac and talk about his relationship to the civil rights movement 
and the conversations that were going on between Jews and Methodists in Barbados. In 1819 to 1820, Isaac had found himself at the unhappy center of a civil rights dispute about Jews on the island of Barbados. Born enslaved, he was through his mother, the nephew of <clears throat> sorry, the island's first national hero, a woman who had fought for civil rights for all people of African ancestry. Yet even his aunt couldn't save him from being demoted to a second class member of the synagogue when he attempted to get the Jews the right to vote. And in this lecture, I'm going to reveal the little known dialogue between early Barbadian Jews and Christians over the relationship between salvation and freedom. Tonight, I'm going to talk about that dialogue through three main routes. First, I'm going to get at why were religion and civil rights so entangled in early Barbados? Second, why were Jewish and black rights entangled? And then third and finally, how was it that the Lopez and Gill families allowed for some of this conversation and dialogue between these two congregations? So I wanna go ahead and begin with that first question why were religion and civil rights so entangled in terms of the island's history? In order to understand this, it's really helpful to know that the island is broken down geographically and politically into 11 parishes, each of which were centered around one Anglican church. So for example, St. Joseph's Parish has centered around St. Joseph's Church. And each of these churches were a vestry, that is a parish parliament. So technically, the parish referred not just to the geographical area or the congregants or the church property, but also to a political unit in terms of the island's uh, um, structure. And this vestry was the seat of the local government within the parish, but in addition, each parish would elect two members to the house of the assembly on the island. So in that sense, you couldn't get access to the larger political system without first becoming a member of this parish. Now, that didn't mean that there weren't other churches on the island. Um, so, for example, in this early map, we see a Quakers meeting house. But it did mean that those members of those other churches couldn't vote unless they also belonged to an Anglican congregation. And I'm sure that some of you will be interested to know what about Catholic churches? So the Catholics, um, Catholic Church did not come to the island of Barbados until um, 1838. So sadly, I'm uh, sorry, until 1848. So not until after general emancipation, which was in 1838. So sadly, they're not part of my story today, but I'll, I'll reference them occasionally. Um, but I think it is important to think about them in this relationship of what I'm gonna talk about is minor religions, that is religions that are not part of the state system on the island. And today, Catholics make up about 4% of the island's population. Prior to 1831, not everybody within any of those Anglican parishes could vote, even if they belonged to the Anglican church. So obviously one needed to be male and one needed to be white, but you also had to pay a certain level of taxes to own a certain amount of property. And we see this represented again in early maps, which lay out not only the parishes, but who could vote within the parish by indicating who owned enough property within that particular area. And because of this emphasis on owning enough land in order to vote, the island's government system is often referred to as a plantocracy that is made up of planters. And this meant that men like Abraham Rodriguez Brandon, the father of Sarah and Isaac, couldn't vote. Even though he had several plantations spread across the island, he was not Anglican, so therefore he would not have access to the government system. So civil rights in religion were entangled in that particular way, but also because the Anglican church was the primary place where race was assigned on the island. And this was most commonly done 
when people were getting baptized, so at birth, but could also happen later at marriage and much less likely at death because you don't need to vote once you're dead. So they don't care as much about racial assignment anymore. So we see this um, in some of the baptismal records. This is an example from St. Michael's Church, now Cathedral in the parish of St. Michael's, uh, which is where Bridgetown is. And we see that in the first instance here, Elizabeth Ann, the natural daughter, that is illegitimate daughter of Margaret Miles, the date that she was born and no race is given, which means that she's white, as opposed to John, the son of Amaryllis Charlotte, who's designated as being free and then a person of color. Um, so again, it, or here's somebody who's designated as being enslaved and who she's the property of. So the in this sense, that first step towards whether you could get civil rights, whether you were considered white enough, uh, white or not, was directly being kept track of by the Anglican Church. In addition, the layout of the churches on the island, particularly the Anglican churches, really reinforced and then rationalized this racial discrimination. So a really important example of this is that the Anglican churches, um, you'd think that seats in the balcony would mean you're closer to God, not so in the tropics because of course they're very very hot in an air before um before air conditioning and so the seats in the balcony were typically reserved for people who had some african ancestry regardless of whether they were free or enslaved and similarly just as the minister was seen as part of this pyramid leading up to christ at the top that access to that leadership pyramid was limited um, because only people who were white and men could access this first level. So in that sense, conversations with the divine within the Anglican church were mediated through this sort of racial hierarchy. In contrast to this system, the Quakers on the island, um, this is a, a Quaker meeting house elsewhere because as you'll find out, Quakers did not persist on the island for very long, for reasons I'll get to. Um, in contrast to that, that larger structure, were typically square because they wanted to emphasize the sort of way in which all of the people in the meeting house had this direct revelation or this emphasis on the inner light. So by 1680, Quakers made up about 6% of the island's white population, and there are five meeting houses spread across the island. As in, in other places, Quakers were typically anti-slavery. Um, and in fact, we see George Fox coming to the island in 1671, speaking against the poor treatment of the enslaved. So while some of the Quakers on the island did actually enslave people, in general, their community's theology emphasized equality and the love for everyone, and the core principle that God was in everybody. Thus, Quakers on the island tended to convert people of color and work to improve the conditions of enslaved peoples. This did not go unnoticed by the Anglicans, and it resulted in large scale arrest between 1674 and 1693 um, and of Quakers. And as late as 1735, a time when Quakers were generally completely accepted in most other parts of the Atlantic world, at least one visiting minister was reportedly shot for preaching the Quaker way on the island. Um, all this has led historians to suggest that perhaps Quakerism was a bad fit for island culture, at least the way that the plantocracy was structured. And by 1800, um, the Quakers movement on the island was no longer in existence and there's no surviving buildings from that time period. We might similarly see Jews as being a kind of bad fit for the island plantocracy as well, even though they tended not to be run off in the way that Quakers were. Early on, there had been two synagogues on the island. Um, first, this one that's still in existence, this pink one in Bridgetown, and then also one further north in Spakestown, which had been destroyed in 1739 in an anti-Semitic riot. And synagogue minutes suggest that, like with the Quakers, the Jewish theology was considered offensive to the Anglican way of being. So we have certain 
members of the governance board pointing out that with respect to Isaac, in particular at a religious point of view, we make no distinction between Mr. Brandon's son, who's a man of color, and any other member of our community. So this idea that somehow theologically, in the eyes of God, all Jews are the same. Of the non-Anglican congregations on the island, however, it was Methodist churches that were considered the most threatening to the Anglican community. Like the Quakers, the Methodist church felt that there were just as many rulers as there were members. That is, um, anybody could be a ruler of the congregation. And even the requirement for kneeling in order to receive communion um, was eliminated from the prayer book. In this context, Methodism became an act of rebellion and Methodism's religious egalitarianism was taken as an affront to the class and racial system, which was deeply embedded in British colonial society. And we see that even a generation earlier, the Duchess of Buckingham had haughtily explained that Methodism's doctrines were, quote, most repulsive and strongly tinctured with impertinence and disrespect towards their superiors and perpetually endeavoring to level all ranks and do away with distinctions. It's monstrous, she says, to be told that you have a heart as sinful as the common wretches that crawl the earth. I mean, to explain why she might have thought this other than being a duchess, she is also the illegitimate or natural daughter of King James II. Um, so while it was heinous to people like the duchess that people in power were considered um, equal to others, Methodist theology really offered hope to the disenfranchised on the island because it emphasized that anyone could be saved by justification through faith. And this spiritual revolution was reflected in the ideal form of the Methodist church, which was like the Quaker church, very small and intimate. And unlike the race-based seating of the Anglican chapels, the Methodist seating plans emphasized equal access rather than hierarchy. Indeed, one didn't have to be male, white, or even attend a seminary in order to become a teacher in the Methodist church. And again, uh, just to be a, a little off track, but I think it will interest you that um, the Catholic churches in Barbados, um, this is a rebuilding of one of the earliest ones, the one from 1848 that was burnt down and then rebuilt, seem to have learned somewhat from the Anglican mistakes in that they don't have those hot seats on the second floor problem. And instead of use the height of the chapel to channel the hot air upward, but keep everything on the same floor in this much more intimate feel. Okay, so back to our earlier era. The denial of voting and political appointment by non-Anglicans, as well as the ways in which Quaker, Jewish, and Methodist theology potentially undermine justifications for the island's race-based government can help us understand why civil rights activism in that decade leading up to general emancipation occurred in both the Methodist church and the island's main synagogue at the same time. And so you'll remember Quakers are gone by this point, but I think very interestingly, the original Quaker burial ground in Bridgetown is actually right between these two congregations of the Methodist and the Jewish congregation. This connection between voting and politics and religion can also help us understand why Jewish and black rights were so entangled at this point in the island's history. Free people of color and Jews received the right to vote in the exact same year, 1831, and hence I think is somewhat tempting, and this was one of my early sort of theories, was that maybe Jews receiving the right to vote um, or were being kept from voting because they were being increasingly rational racialized during this time period. But the island record suggests that this is not the case. Instead, the key element that they seem to have had in common was this idea of using civil rights as a reward for supporting or going against the status quo. Both Jewish um, and civil rights for elite men of color came in the wake of the major rebellion that rocked the island, the major slave revolt in 1816. And that rebellion had started in the southeastern parish uh, 
of Christ Church and then of St. Philip and then spread out to Christ Church, St. John, St. Thomas, and even into parts of St. Michael where Bridgetown was. And participants in this rebellion emphasized they were loyal to the crown, they just weren't loyal to the plantocracy, um, which was an idea that they put forth in their flag and their iconography to support the rebellion. Um, however, the British government was not swayed by this idea that you could somehow separate out the crown and the, and the planters. And despite its initial brilliance, the revolt by the enslaved people on the island was crushed within a week and over a thousand enslaved people lost their lives and there was over 750 million pounds worth of damage in today's money um, as a result of the, of the revolt. The aftermath of this revolt in the years in the 1820s and going forward was a period of martial law, but also a period where we see the plantocracy repaying all the people who had supported them during the slave revolt. And so we see the wealthy free men of color who the leading whites felt were the quote, most respectable of their class and who had been highly uh, meritorious during the insurrection were given many privileges in order to sort of pay them back for their support of the planters during the revolt. And this included giving a privileges to men like John Castello Montefiore and Benjamin Williams Messiah, two very wealthy free men of color who had roots both in the Anglican church and in the Jewish community. In addition, we see this even earlier, this attempt to kind of use different kinds of ways of pulling free people of color into the plantocracy, for example, by offering them the ability to enslave people themselves. So we see early on some of these very wealthy free men of color giving petitions to the government, arguing that they need to be allowed to enslave other people. And again, we can see this as like an attempt to kind of offering those rewards of um, privileges as a way of pulling them into and making them part of that, that system of the plantocracy. Yet amidst all these tensions, people who fought on behalf of the enslaved also were fighting, but they tended to use not revolt or secular requests, but rather to entwine the requests for civil rights with religion. So it's this period right after the revolt of like, how are we gonna go about getting civil rights? without being completely shut down. And the answer for people is religion. What my research shows that is new is that in many ways, these struggles during this time period by Methodists and by Jews were a family affair, that the leaders of both of these congregations were related and the dialogues that were going on between the congregations fed into these bids for civil rights. So I want to now turn to what is that family connection by looking at the Lopez and Gill families. And I wanna start with the more famous of the two sides of the rebellion. And that is the fight by the Methodists waged by a woman named Anne Jordan Gill. Born in 1781, Anne Jordan was the daughter of a white man named Edward Jordan who is the heir to a very extensive plantation in St. James Parish. By the time of her father's death in 1799, however, Anne was living in Bridgetown along Church Street and was being cared for by a woman named Nanny Go, who was also enslaved to her father. When her father died in 1799, Anne inherited not only the house that she was living in and all the furniture, but also a carriage house and property along Church Street and a thousand pounds outright, as well as an annuity. In addition, she inherited four enslaved people, including Nanny Go, the woman who had been caring for her. And again, we see this sort of attempt to co-opt people into the plantocracy. 
And it's unclear if Anne Jordan had also begun her life enslaved, but at least by the time of her father's death, she was a free woman of color, and she had begun to be known around town as a woman of fashion and pleasure. In 1809, when she was 28 years old, she married a man named Alexander George Gill at St. Michael's Church, so that main Anglican church in the parish where Bridgetown is found. And like Anne, Alexander George Gill came from a multiracial family with a white Anglican father and an enslaved mother, a woman named Jemima Lopez. And But unlike Anne, Alexander and his brothers and sister and mother and grandmother were not enslaved to Anglicans, but rather to a Sephardic family of, with the last name Lopez. And indeed, one of Alexander George Gill's half-sisters, Christian, would become an important friend for Anne and a collaborator in the Methodist Church. Also distinct from Anne, who was her father's main heiress, because George had these several families by different women, he had um, multiple heirs. Um, so the family's wealth was spread out a little bit more. Nonetheless, in 1801, Alexander George Gill had inherited not only a house, which he was supposed to share with his brothers and sister, and along with the furniture, but also at least one enslaved person named Jack James. Between 1809 and 1814, when her husband died quite young, the couple had two children named Edward George Gill and Alexander Boville Gill. And following her husband's death in 1814, she turned to religion for solace, and it changed the way that she thought about things. So at this moment, even though she had been married in the Anglican Church, and even though her husband was buried in the Anglican Church, her spiritual awakening causes her to abandon Anglicanism and instead to become a Methodist. And she joined the radical Bridgetown congregation run by Reverend William Shrewsbury. Shrewsbury's church was physically close to the town center and only a short block from the synagogue. And it faced St. James Street, one of the main thoroughfares through Bridgetown. Over the next six years, Anne Jordan Gill would play a crucial role in the congregation's attempts to reshape the city. Gill quickly became central to Shrewsbury's Methodist congregation, and in many ways um, that was a family affair. Although it's not clear which of the women joined first, Anne and her sister-in-law, Christian Gill, were both active members. And in fact, a hymnal that was first owned by her kind of half-mother-in-law Joanna Gill, and then went to Christian Gill, and then to Ann Jordan, and now is in the Barbados National Archives, and it's the only personal possession we have of Ann Jordan that's known to survive. And despite her late start in turning to Methodism, Gill quickly rose through the congregation's ranks, becoming first a class leader. That is sort of what I think what you would call a lay minister. So she's a lay woman who ran the weekly groups through which Methodists would account for their faith. And in 1820, Christian Gill and Ann Jordan became spiritual guides, not only to people of color in the community, but also to a young white woman named Hilaria King, who had had a conversion experience following hearing one of Reverend Shrewsbury's more moving sermons. And Christiana Gill and Ann Jordan took in King as an understudy, not only in Methodism, but in their work for what they called the benefit of the outcasts of society, um, which in this case mainly meant the people who are enslaved or the poorer members of the free people of color in the community. Gill's central role in that congregation, whoop, let me go back, uh, whoop, was enhanced two years later when King and Reverend Shrewsbury were united in marriage. And notably, they get married at the Anglican church where Anne had married her own husband because Shrewsbury can't marry himself. Um, so he, he has to turn to the Anglicans for help in terms of getting married. So as I've already noted, that divide between the Anglicans and the Methodists on questions of race was substantial. So Anne Jordan's new friends, Shrewsbury and his wife, 
were really on the radical edge of island life. In addition to allowing women and people of color to teach, Methodism also provided a place where people could integrate African religions into their worship. So much that Shrewsbury noted that one critic referred to Methodist missionaries as, quote, agents of the villainous African society. Whereas the Af Anglican legislature had outlawed Afro-Caribbean spiritual practices involving the body, like drumming and obeah, Methodists were actively using embodied religion to break down barriers. So for critics, this rupture between the physical and the spiritual was very threatening because Methodists were envisioning a spiritual realm that would reject those race-based hierarchies that the island was centered on. So in that sense, Methodism is really offering a new kind of spiritual power. Methodists were also extremely outspoken about courting people with African ancestry. And from the Methodist point of view, Anglicans had really neglected the islands enslaved and free colored communities. Um, in times they had even prohibited them from attending church. And this really struck at the core of Methodist horror about Anglicanism. They were really upset that people wouldn't have even heard one word of religious instruction in their whole lives. And in contrast, the Methodists welcomed people of African ancestry whom they addressed as brother and sister, a practice that the white Anglicans perceived as dangerous because it implied equality. Methodism also seems to have affected Anne Jordan Gill and her sister Christian Gill's views on slaveholding. Though in 1820, they both had people who were enslaved to them. Um, by 1823, there was only one enslaved person in Anne's household. And so while we don't know precisely what drew her to Methodism, we do know that Anglicans did not take this sort of abolitionist and spiritual equality aspect of Methodism lightly. So by 1823, the Anglicans on the island decided enough was enough. And on October 19th, an angry mob of white Anglicans attacked Shrewsbury's St. James Street Methodist Church and um, reduced the entire chapel as well as the minister's private apartment completely to rubble. If that were not enough, the next day they came back and collected all the rubble, carted it down to the bay and threw it into the ocean. So really clear, do not rebuild, do not come back from this particular moment. And that kind of ire against the Methodist chapel was not isolated. In the 1680s, we'd also seen the governor closing down Quaker meeting houses following anti-slavery agitation. And um, in that sense, the Methodists were only one of a series of minority religious groups that Anglicans were targeting for disrupting racism on the island. And these mob tactics worked because, as Reverend Shrewsbury later explained, in Barbados, there were not really any police. So Shrewsbury complained that some of the magistrates, those are Anglicans, knew I knew to be enemies, but I could depend on none of them for protection. He was convinced that the mob would have killed him if they had gotten their hands on him. And so he chartered a boat and by October 20th, the very next day after his whole church is thrown into the bay, um, he and his wife, along with their quote, wreck of goods, flee the island never to return. And Anne Jordan Gill steps in to fill this pastoral breach. Her work for filling the pastoral breach did not go unnoticed. And soon after Shrewsbury left, a mob of 200 people surrounded Gill's house, which as you can see is very close to where the, the church is located, and threatened to tear down her house if she didn't stop preaching. But she persisted. And so the magistrate stepped in and forbade her from holding any religious services in her home. Her response was not to stop, but to meet people in groups of two or three, which didn't technically, um, wasn't technically forbidden. So again, she was brought before the magistrates and told to renounce her evangelizing. And she responded, sirs, I've learned from my Bible that in matters of conscience, I ought to obey God rather than man. 
The magistrates responded by threatening punishment if she continued. But by January of 1824, her congregation had swollen from 40 people up to 90, the vast majority of whom were people of color. And Gill offered her own money in order to rebuild the ruined chapel. Conflict continued to follow her and rumors began to be spread that Gill was stockpiling weapons in her house and Anglicans began to burn um, depictions of Gill and other Methodists in effigy. In 1825, she was asked to appear again before the magistrates to be tried after a complaint that she was still convening public religious meetings. And this trial lingered on for eight weeks, spinning into new problems. She was eventually found guilty, but the case then moved to the Court of Grand Sessions, which was a really disturbing moment because means now instead of being seen as a civil case, she's being tried under criminal law. And she wrote to Shrewsbury fearful that she was about to be imprisoned. Before the British Parliament stepped in, all of her expenses, uh, the trial expenses drained her resources. Um, and finally, the British Parliament told the Anglicans that they needed to rethink their position. And for the rest of her life, while she remained out of jail, she was a steadfast Methodist leader on the island. After her death, the Methodists came and placed Sarah before her name in order to commemorate her work as a Methodist matriarch. And today the Methodist Church on St. James Street has several memorials to her and was indeed built with money from the house that she donated. More than 150 years later, Gill is still commemorated as one of 10 national heroes of Barbados, and she was the first and for many years the only woman to achieve that status, though um, very recently Rihanna became the second woman to become a female national hero. Unlike the singer, Gill is the only Barbadian, however, who is memorialized for using religion as the primary tool to aid the struggle for civil rights. And Isaac's attempt to use Judaism to circumvent racial barriers to the vote for, for Jewish peoples is a similar reminder of the larger nexus of religion and rebellion on the island. And indeed, in the decades leading up to that 1833 to 34 general emancipation, we see the island's press variously targeting Methodists and Jewish congregations with providing people of color with a sympathetic place to congregate and a vocabulary for agitating for civil rights. While it's tempting to see the island's press as somehow paranoid about minority religions taking over the island, evidence suggests that there actually was cross-pollination between the Methodist and Jewish congregations. And once again, that extended Brandon Gill clan was partially to blame. So here's Ann Jordan, here's her nephew, Isaac Lopez Brandon, and through the Brandons, um, Isaac's first cousin, Yael, is married to Abraham Israel Keyes, who's the Hazan or leader of the island synagogue. And what we find out is that um, this conduit between the two groups was important. So Keyes regularly features in Shrewsbury's Barbadian Journal as the synagogue's Jewish reader. And according to Shrewsbury, he's one of several different members of the Jewish congregation who would come and attend the Methodist congregation and would travel back and forth between the two communities. Indeed, at least before the passage of the Jewish vestry bill, the Methodists and Jews seem to have shared some basic beliefs. Like the Methodist Jews initially argued on the behalf of spiritual equality for all people who were Jewish. Although the island's Jewish community would eventually be pressured into taking back that stance, its initial response reflected the Jewish theological position that all Jews had the same type of soul, regardless of race. And Isaac's role in the bid for Jewish rights for both European and multiracial Jews underscores the way in which Judaism was resisting the island's racial order before it ultimately had to adapt to meet it. And with that in mind, I'd like to turn to Isaac Lopez Brandon and the fight for Jewish rights on the island.
So Isaac was born in 1792 to a Sephardic Jew named Abraham Rodriguez Brandon and to a woman who would eventually become Anne Jordan Gill's sister-in-law, Sarah Esther Gill. Until 1801, when he was manumitted or freed with the help of his father, Isaac and his three sisters, only one of which survived to adulthood, Sarah, his mother, his uncles, his grandmother, and his great-grandmother all lived enslaved to the Lopez family along Swan Street near the island's main synagogue. After gaining his freedom, he lived in that house that I had mentioned on Hartley's Alley that William um, Gill had, that Alexander George Gill and his brothers had inherited. And um, he lived there minus his great grandmother and his younger sisters who still remained enslaved to the Lopez's. This was to change, however, in 1811 to 1812, when he, like his very famous aunt, had this religious awakening. And unlike her, he turned not to Methodism, but instead to Judaism. And so he and his sister, who was aged about 12 to 13 at the time, traveled to nearby Suriname to convert officially to Judaism. So I'm happy to talk about this more in the question and answer, but in Barbados, it was very rare for there to be conversions to Judaism, probably um, in large response to some of the anti-Semitism that happened early in the island that the Jews were a little skittish about converting people. Um, so Suriname is the place that they go instead. And Suriname makes sense as a place to travel to convert um, at that point. Um, maybe not today, but at that point, it made a lot of sense. Um, because it had the second largest Jewish community in all of America, so much larger than, say, New York at the time, and much larger than Barbados, and in addition had the largest multiracial Jewish community in all of the Americas, um, such that by the time the siblings arrived, about half of the Jewish community would have had at least one African ancestor. After their conversion, Sarah goes on to London, where she attends an elite Sephardic boarding school with thanks to her father who pays for it. But Isaac returns instead to Barbados, where he happily nestles into Jewish life on the island, that is happily until 1819. So um, all things were going well, except for in 1819, Isaac decided um, to do something which seemingly was innocuous, which was to sign the Jews petition to the island legislature asking to make the Bridgetown synagogue a vestry. So you'll remember that belonging to a vestry, one of those parish congregations that controls the local government and elects men to the island's legislature was one of those few qualifications that Jews as non Anglicans lacked in order to be able to vote. So this was a really clever loophole. By making the synagogue of Estri, the island Jews would be able to vote without having to convert to Christianity, um, or at least some of the Jews would be able to vote. So from the perspective of the Jews who would have been able to vote, that is the congregations in our circle, that bill was clearly like a boon. These were a man of property like Isaac's father, Abraham Rodriguez Brandon, or Joseph Montefiore, all of whom heartily supported this proposal. And that was because turning the synagogue into a vestry would give them the power to ensure that all the Jews were paying their religious taxes to the synagogue. So um, at this point, you were supposed to pay your taxes, um, regardless of if you ever went to synagogue or not, if you happen to be a Jew. And mandatory synagogue taxes would mean that all the Jews who could afford to do so would have to pay for the extremely large growing burden of the Jewish poor instead of disproportionately um, expecting men like Abraham Rodriguez Brandon or the Montefiores um, to pay for that out of a sense of duty. Moreover, since the wealthier Jews on the island owned extensive real estate, being a member of the vestry was one of the very few qualifications for voting that they lacked. For Jewish men who were of a more middling sort, though, the bill was extremely distressing. Lower to middle class men did not have sufficient property to vote in the general elections anyway, 
And now whatever money they did have, they were going to lose to those mandatory synagogue taxes. So these are men like Isaac Leotold, Joshua Levy, Moses Pinheiro, people who have no surviving portraits because they didn't have enough money. Um, so these are men who were either new to the congregation, relatively new, or had recently sort of dragged themselves out of those swelling ranks of the synagogue's poor. And while they were no longer extremely poor, they remembered how when they didn't have enough money to get by, their families had been forced to beg the synagogue board for a pension to cover the most basic of needs. So anytime they needed a new suit of clothes, they could go to synagogue or they wanted an apprenticeship, they had to go begging to the synagogue. And the synagogue records are full of all these demeaning requests as well as unfulfilled needs. So it's very arbitrary who ended up getting their requests fulfilled. Moreover, despite having clawed their way out of that poverty, these men quickly realized they were never going to join the ranks of the synagogue board, which they rightly understood was controlled by this hereditary group of men who were the elite members of the congregation. And that was because key positions on the synagogue board tend to be passed from one wealthy father to his son and never made it to this sort of nouveau middle class. So that meant that even though they were tax paying members of the congregation and in theory could vote within the synagogue, they would never gain most of the privileges associated with being members of full members of the congregation. And as a result, they quickly became annoyed and stopped paying their synagogue taxes. To make matters worse, it now became clear to them that wealthy men of color like Isaac Lopez Brandon would be able to gain the privileges that as white Jews of the middling sort wouldn't ever be able to attain. So Isaac, who already paid more synagogue taxes than most whites, stood to inherit his father's position on the synagogue board. So during this time period, his father was often the synagogue president. And if the synagogue were to become a vestry, Isaac would be able to vote in the general elections and perhaps even serve in the island legislature. And this was more than the middling Jews could bear. As a result, the middling Jews and other opponents tried a variety of tactics to undermine the attempt to get Jews the right to vote. So they started to send all these requests to the island legislature, please do not put, pass the Jewish vestry bill. And they started off with sort of a horrifying tactic, which was trying to appeal to base anti-Semitism. So they said like, Jews, they're outsiders and not very trustworthy. Do you think you should make them a vestry? Seems like a bad idea. And you're like, what are you talking about? Like you're saying this about other Jews? Um, and fortunately, this strategy failed. So the Anglicans were unimpressed and expressed sort of outrage that they would be thought of as being so intolerant. Um, and the, instead, the opponents start to focus their anger on Isaac instead. And in doing so, they turned to Isaac and hit on a nerve that really made the Anglicans sit up and listen, because they pointed out that with the Jewish vestry bill, it would circumvent the island's law by allowing Jewish men of color, men like Isaac Lopez Brannan, the ability to vote. Because if you were Anglican, he couldn't be a voting member of the congregation, but as a Jew, he could vote. And um, so really it sort of, this was something that was really a concern for the island legislature and caused one of the assembly men to add a clause to the bill saying that um, there would, prevent anybody who is descended from anybody who is African from participating in the privileges of the bill. So they pass the motion, but with this clause that means that Isaac won't be allowed to vote anyway. Um, and they send it back to the synagogue for approval and fights break out in the synagogue. Like, should we, should we accept this? Should we not accept this? And in the end, sadly, having a powerful father and a cousin who was the the religious leader of the congregation was not enough. And instead, um, Isaac's name was taken off of the list of the voting members of the congregation. So he's in effect kicked out of the synagogue. So in this struggle, the synagogue really loses an important source of revenue and it completely alienates Isaac's father, who was their biggest donor. <laughs> 
ironically, all that controversy was for naught because King George IV overturned the Jewish Vestry Bill in 1822, and it wasn't until 1831 that both Jews and free men of color on the island were finally given the right to vote. Meanwhile, the damage was done, and Isaac's wrote, right to vote in the congregation was not reinstated for several decades. In the meantime, Isaac was fed up with Barbados and traveled north first to Philadelphia and then to New York, where his younger sister Sarah had married into the Moses family, one of the most prominent families in early New York. And Isaac becomes his brother-in-law's business partner and eventually marries his sister. And those connections to the Moses family finally allow him to become a voting member, not only of Congregation Sheriff Israel, despite rampant racism in early New York and even in the congregation, but also through the help of his new in-laws to become a naturalized citizen of the United States, something typically denied to people of color during this time period. So he not only gains the right to vote in the synagogue, but also in the United States as well. So in conclusion, in his willingness to risk everything for what he was believing in, Isaac wasn't alone in this particular moment in the religious communities of Barbados. Rather, as I've suggested, Isaac's battle was part of this larger religious war being waged by non-Anglicans on the island. And for the Gill and Lopez family, that battle underscored the intertwined roles of minority religions and rights on the island. In the traditional history of the island, the Methodist struggle has been positioned in isolation, but I hope that I showed how dialogue and family connections between Jews and Methodists suggest that the Methodist rebellion against racism should be understood as part of this larger history of minority religions and their role in claiming civil rights in the island's history. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much. I would be happy to take questions from people. Thank you, Dr. Lehman. This was extraordinary and fascinating. I do see that there's a question in the chat that asks for some clarification regarding whether property owning Jews were owners specifically of sugar plantations and perhaps slaves. And also, can you say a little bit more about what you mean by middling Jews? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, so property owning Jews, typically Jews, um, very early on in the island's history, Jews had come to the island um, in part were welcomed in because they brought knowledge of sugar production. So really early on in the island's history, they actually helped set up the sugar economy. And this results in an anti-Semitic backlash. And there is island legislation that limits the number of people that Jews can enslave. And that forces most of the Jewish community into becoming merchants. And so even after that legislature changes, most Jews on the island initially get their start as merchants. So um, some of those merchants end up being so successful that they're able to buy sugar plantations later. So that would include people like Abraham Rodriguez Brandon, the sibling's father. But there are also a bunch of other people who are sort of have are merchants, but not in the like way of like, I've got big ships and I'm sending stuff across the sea and I've got 10,000 pounds worth of goods that are going from here to there, but rather um, in the sense that I own a small shop in Bridgetown and I live in an apartment above it. And that's the kind of um, family that I mean more by that middling sort of Jew. Um, so those could be Jews who would also occasionally own one or two enslaved people, but tended to be um, much lower on the social economic status and much closer to that vast majority of Jews who are really just incredibly poor. So we have 50% of the Jewish community is completely poor. We have the people in this little wafer layer above them and then the people who like Abraham who are incredibly wealthy. Um, so the middling people are like out of poverty but not fabulously wealthy. Thank you. We have a few more questions coming in. To what extent is the experience uh, of this family that you're describing, uh, to what extent does it find parallels on the island uh, in terms of other Jewish Christian relations or perhaps elsewhere in the Americas? 
Yeah, so that's a great question that one of the things um, that's really interesting about Jewish communities in the Caribbean um, is how much they're intertwined with each other. And we see a little bit of that of the family going down to Suriname, which although on the mainland is considered part of the Caribbean uh, culture because it's on the Caribbean basin. Um, and one of the strongest parallels other than Suriname of the sort of activism is in Jamaica, where it's just the same sort of thing that we have exactly the same moment of Jews and free people of color getting civil rights almost simultaneously, somewhat differently in Jamaica that actually seems to be because Jews were racialized slightly differently. And um, in addition, there seems to have been much more cooperation between the two communities. So I think there's each one has like got some parallels, but some differences. Um, Suriname would be the other place that I think is a really interesting both parallel but with differences and I had mentioned that Suriname has this very large community of Jews with partial African ancestry and that community engages in its own civil rights petitions both against the general government but also against the white Jewish community um, that often has these very repressive legislations against them and so for me the Suriname example is really exciting and part of what's so interesting about, I didn't talk about that here, but part of what's interesting about Isaac having gone down and been part of that community is there's a very large activist group within that community struggling for, for Jewish rights for Jews of color and includes a lot of women as well, which I find fascinating that you, you see all these early Jewish women fighting and resisting some of the oppression that's going on at the time. Wow, fascinating. Uh, I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more uh, about Sephardi Jewry. There might be people on this call who are not familiar with Sephardi Jewry. And sure. so I'm curious to know where do we know where these Jews came from? You know, um, Sephardi is sort of like a catch all, it's a huge term yeah. that could point to any number of origin places. So do you have information about where this family came from? And can yeah. you say a little bit more about that migration pattern more broadly? Yeah, sure. So Sephardic Jews are Jews who have um, either come directly from Iberia, so Spain and Portugal, or have ancestors that came from Spain and Portugal. And when there's the forced conversion of Jews in Iberia, we get a group of people who leave immediately and go to mainly the Ottoman lands. And um, we refer to those people as Eastern Sephardim because they're in towards the east. And then there's people who leave Spain and instead go to Portugal um, as an attempt to stay in Iberia but still have some freedom. And unfortunately, right after they get there within five years, they also have been told that either they need to convert or they need to leave and leave their children behind. And so we have this very, what was a very core religious group of the Sephardic community in Iberia, rather than give up their children, converts to to Catholicism. And that group um, are mainly the people that we refer to as Western Sephardim. So they come up to Amsterdam and to London and Hamburg, and then often straight to the colonies. And so that's the group of people that most of the people on the island are related to that I've been talking about. So the Lopez family and the, the children's father, Abraham Rodriguez Brandon, are Portuguese Jews through this sort of securitist route. It doesn't mean they never were in Spain. It just means they were part of this one group um, that came through Portugal. So within the colonies, the being a Portuguese Jew, um, I think in the US today, we have more Ashkenazi, well, I know we have more Ashkenazi Jews than Sephardic Jews, um, but in, in people have different ideas of like, which culture is fancier than the others, but in the colonies, nobody was in any doubt that Sephardic Jews were the best Jews to be, right? So I guess the Ashkenazi Jews might have mumbled about it, but they were in charge of the synagogues. The rights that were used in the synagogue were, were the Western Sephardic Portuguese rights. And we have in Suriname, even after the Ashkenazi, the German Jews get their own synagogue, they still have to use the Sephardic prayer book. And they're complaining like, why do we have to say our prayers in Spanish? I don't even understand them. So, um, so really the fact that the, when the synagogue, when the, sorry, when the siblings go to 
um, Suriname to convert, they very expressly convert at the Portuguese congregation. And that does help them substantially in terms of their journey because they become Jews of importance. So. Fascinating, thank you so much. Sure. Um, there is another comment coming in. Um, so is there a way to connect this? I mean, obviously it makes a lot of sense to connect this to other uprisings and struggles against slavery uh, in places such as Britain. Um, is there documentation that these, uh, these struggles were connected in any way? Yeah, in fact, a, a great question. Um, so yes, I mean, I think in the sense that um, we actually see both, I, I didn't talk about the Morovians, but the Morovians are also on the island during this time period. And both the Morovians and the Methodists are sort of moving between various islands. And we really see them sort of feeding different struggles at various points. Um, in addition, definitely, um, the slave revolts are are connected one to another as well. So that 1816 Bussa's rebellion is very much because there's rumors on the ground that the that the government is going to respond and give people rights just as had happened in Haiti. And the risk and so they sort of get upset when it doesn't look like anything's happening. They think that there something happened in England and it wasn't being enacted by the planters. So we really do see um, the early Haitian revolutions and other revolutions leading to other revolts in various places and inspiring them. And then also through kind of rumors of like, what is the plantocracy doing? Um, kind of inspiring people as well. So that happens both here and on some of the other islands like Curacao that we see sort of echoes of the Haitian revolution um, and various slave revolts. Wow, thank you so much. And I'm sure this is just the tip of the iceberg of your work. Well, this brings us to the close of our program. I want to thank Dr. Liebman again uh, for delivering this outstanding talk. Her books are widely acclaimed, as I've noted, and they're available on all major bookselling websites. So buy your copies today at a bookseller near you. I wanna thank the Shapiro Foundation for their generous sponsorship. Dr. Stephen Millies, Director of CTU's Bernadine Center, Mr. Peter Cunningham, Associate Director of the Bernadine Center, Ms. Latasha Webster at CTU's Marketing Office, and Ms. Colleen Kennedy for all of their help and support in planning this event. Please stay tuned for our upcoming events, including our Spring Shapiro Lecture on March 21st, which will be delivered by Dr. Ali Sheva Baumgarten of Hebrew University, our Holocaust Education Lecture Series on May 11th and 18th, and the Fall 2022 Shapiro Lecture just around the bend, which will be delivered by Dr. Lauren Schiffman. Registration for these and other events are on our website, ctu.edu backslash um, events. I always say that wrong, but you just have to search it. Just Google CTU events and you'll find us. We hope to see you again very soon.